Dr. Yee Vogus Falcha. Hi, hello and welcome. It is John O'Sullivan from the Irish Pagan School and we are here with our weekly check-in, chat and coffee talk. And in fact, we today we have community questions to answer, which I'm really looking forward to diving into. Um, before we do that, as usual, do make sure you're joining on the mailing list below by clicking the link and getting access to that free resource that we offer with the Irish Pagan School. It is a collection of good resources. It is our recommendations of what are good resources for someone to pursue um, as they begin or deepen or explore their growth in Irish spirituality or Irish paganism and it can help kind of you know head off some kind of very confusing stuff out there because there's a lot of people who promote their own kind of work or their own kind of personal gnosis about stuff um without grounding in the lore or without kind of in you know, a connection to the Irish history Irish culture native Irish experience um so I'm not saying that any of those things are terrible and horrible and etc but like they are all almost all the time missing some facet or some aspect of the whole process and um, so do make sure you pop down and get on the list get your reminders to the invites to our second saturday sessions or our end of month classes that kind of stuff too so with that um i will dive on in with these questions that we got and they're, they're very very interesting questions i'll do my best to to give them justice and honor for the perspective and the energy that the person sent them on so these come from a person called ali and ali sent us a quick question a couple of quick questions few questions um and the first one is how do gods and goddesses become gods and goddesses and that is a very very fascinating one and a very interesting one because especially when we look at it in the Irish context, when we look at other cultural contexts out there, other information out there, there's a lot of creation myths. Um, like if we look at the Norse pantheon, you know, you have the like Bror, who was the father primordial, prim primordial god, and then Odin comes out of him, you know, and they're defined as elemental entities or as gods. And um, when we have a similar thing with the, the Greek myth and mythos and legends about their pantheon, and we have kind of Zeus being born of Kronos um, and like, you know, they're them being the, the linchpin or the, the figure that then becomes a literal father of the gods. It's the rest of the gods are born of them, of their form, of their body or of their union with the sky or the earth or the ground. What's odd with the Irish circumstances is we don't have that. The Irish kind of pantheon and stories and mythology doesn't go back to, and in the beginning, there was only darkness and light. Um, what we have is the existence of the world and the existence of Ireland. And then we have the many different tribes and peoples of the world coming to and from the island. And then their descendants leaving the island and then coming back to the island. So the the talk and story of Irish mythology uh, centering in the mythological cycle is known as Lara Gabala Aaron, the book of the taking of Ireland or the book of invasions. And it is really that that speaks of these multiple iterations of tribes of peoples coming to and froing. And um, now the two of the Danon are the ones who are specifically given information or specifically recognized as the Irish gods. And the two of the Danon are descendants of a, one of the other tribes. I did a video on this previously about the Namidians and it was the sons of Nemet who fled oppression in Ireland and it was their descendants who came back, not just as the two of the Danon, but also as the Fir Bullock. And so the Firbola come in first. There's then the arrival of the Tura Danon, which leads to the first battle of Moitura, the conquest there. And then at the end of the mythological mythological cycle, we have the arrival of the Milesians or Mil Espana or the, the sons of Mil. And they're the ones who come in in conquest, driving the Tura Danon into the hollow hills, into the other world, the Irish other world, or the Shi, where they become known as the Aes Shi, uh, people of the Shi. And it is the, the pretty much the, the Milesians then who are the ancestors of the the Gaels, which is the the Gael people who were the original Irish tribe in the country. Now that's as in the original kind of human tribe, if that makes sense. So there's a lot of kind of stories that we follow from the bloodlines then about the Gaels and their relationships with the two of the Danon. And this is where we get a lot of the the lore and the information that follows throughout the Ulster cycle about how it's important to maintain right relationship with the powers and the denizens of the deities of the other world. And this is where we begin to have to reconsider and recontextualize things to deity. Technically, like when we look at the stories, when we go back into the mythological cycle, no one's called a god. 
no one is called a goddess except for one maybe two um the one most specifically and most famously is of course the dagda in in that his name one of the translations of his name is the good god or the goodly god Be, not because he's morally good or like you know he's he's lawful good in, in character alignment or chaotic good or anything like that at all it's because he's good at everything and we see that at the the arrival or the 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 build up towards the second battle of Maitoro with the invasion of the Fomorians, there's this council of the men of the goddess, which is actually referred to it. It's called the men of the goddess. And there it is, Nuada, Dean Kecht, Dagda, Gwivnu, and um, a couple of sorcerers and cupbearers are also there. And there's a lot of lads who promise all of these things that they're going to bring to the battle against the invading Fomorians to aid the new King Lu. And then at the end of this kind of conference, the Dagda turns around and says, listen, everything you've promised here, all of the works you've promised here, I will take them on myself and see them done. And at that point, Nuda is like, absolutely, like, you know, because you are the Dagda, you are the godly god. And it said the name stuck to him from then on. So in that instance, we have him being known as a god. There is another reference to him previously where the Dagda is said to be um, the good god of Druidry of the two of the Danit. So um, when we look at the rest of the the individuals, like the kings, the queens, lords, like everyone else, um, there are very few. There is a, a, another reference to the Morrigan being a goddess. Um, but it's not, they're not kind of ratified in that way as, you know, born gods or born deities. Um, which is why we end up having like an ancestor approach to certain things. And later Irish tribes came claimed direct descendancy of certain bloodlines connecting back to the two of the Danon. Now, there is another story and it is it's a common story that is it, that goes around. And there are many people who kind of point at it. But I in my delving and my kind of like journey through Irish mythology or the old kind of lore I haven't found an original version of it myself and that's where I am a little bit skeptical about it and in this story it talks about Lou and Lou one of his feats is that he steals the the kind of feast of immortality from Crom Crook or he steals like the knowledge of farming and feasting from Crom Crook now the the challenge we have is that Crom Crook is an older Irish deity again but because we don't have, uh, we we only have certain stories that were recorded, the certain information that we know we have lost over time, and so whether Crom Cruach is some older primordial deity or older primordial entity, like um, Broar or like Kronos in those circumstances, or the Kyliok, in for instance, the the creating creator Kyliok, um, running around with like rocks in her apron and dropping the rocks to form the mountains is one of the other kind of formation. Not Again, it's not a creation mythology because it doesn't create the world. It's something that does shape and create Ireland. Um, and then, of course, there's Lear, the very famous, like, you know, his son, who's very famous, Manon and Mach Lear, which is the, the the god of son of the sea, Manon and son of the sea. Um, but Lear is, is said to be not just um, the ocean. Lear is capitalized with an L in that there was an, an entity or an energy known as Lear. But again, we don't have information on that. The later, more modern stories, the children of Lear, where the children are cursed and turned into swans, that's not the same Lear um, in many instances, even though it's similar name. But you could point to the fact that the Dagda is called Ukud, but the king of the Firbolg is also called Ukud. So just because someone has the same name doesn't mean they're the same character. There's like two Bresh, for instance, and that caused me great confusion. Um, so, yeah, there it's. I feel like I'm going off on a tangent there, so I'm going to rein it back pretty quick there's this story about Lou stealing the feast or stealing the knowledge of farming or feasting or this immortality from Crom Crook. It, it fits with, it, it's almost like a mimicry of many other stories in other cultures um, where that same hero type character performs some feat, either stealing the power of fire or stealing the knowledge of harvest or, you know, stealing like the ambrosia or anything like that at all so that it could be made available to others um, from some niggardly or miserly kind of deity. And like even Odin go goes to like steal, I think it's like a, a 
particular cauldron that makes the particular kind of mead or beer that is like you know very fulfilling and he kind of tricks a giant actually a giantess um by seducing her and then you know stealing the cauldron so it's there's a lot kind of that goes on with all of these circumstances but the fact that i haven't found an original story about this is the the why i still have question marks over it there's another reference to Gwivnu. Um, Grivnu being the 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 smith god of the two of the Danon, and there's a reference to him having the secrets of the feast and the feast of Grivnu. Um, but again, I haven't been able to to kind of bring that into full kind of information or full kind of source or reference or resource. So to answer the question, to bring it back around, how did the gods or goddesses become gods and goddesses? When it's talking about the Irish kind of gods, in particular the two of the Danon, we don't know that for sure. You know, we have some individuals who are declared because of their their knowledge in druidry or because of their service to their community. We also have the two of going into the other world, um, which is said to be on Sealella, and there they kind of live forever, and they are like the land of the immortals is over there, like Tirnanog of Ever Young, and it's they they still have an important kind of influence down through the eras, especially through the Ulster cycle. We still have lots of interactions with the the, the gods and the, the children of the two of Danon as well, um, which is how it then begins to to come down into the language that maybe these bloodlines, claiming bloodlines, claiming kind of having banshees or older kind of deities looking after your family or to, uh, that your family is descended from them. Um, the Ogonacht tribe of Munster is said to be descended from from Ondagda. Um, so it's a common kind of thing in order to connect um, a, a kingship or a bloodline or a family to a location or to um, the ancient kind of stories of Ireland. And that kind of really beds them into the landscape. Um, but it's there is no, this is how exactly they became gods or goddesses. Um, the next question Ali has is, would I be an Irish pagan if I'm not from Ireland? Or do I need to just say I practice or believe in Irish paganism? Um, This one is this one's a bit tricky because when you say you're an Irish, that one is a very, very complex circumstance, especially for people who are born of Ireland or who grow up in Ireland. Um because those people are are native Irish, like, you know, they are Irish. But then we have Irish diaspora or Irish descendants, people who are, you know, born outside of Ireland, but descended from people who were born in Ireland or whose parents were born in Ireland. And that's where we begin to have this generational drift. I, I have had a very confusing conversations with people when I have traveled the world where they refer to themselves as Irish in the broadest of American accents. And I'm like, okay. And then they're like, yeah, yeah, my great granddad came over or, you know, these, this, this, my granny or whatever it was. And it's like, okay, so you're Irish American. And it, it, it caused me some interesting conversations in the past because I had to clarify for someone who got very, a little bit disgruntled when I said, you're not Irish, you're Irish American. They thought I was being disparaging. I wasn't. I was trying to honor and acknowledge the efforts that their ancestors had by surviving, not just by traveling there, but by surviving the trip there and then also surviving and building a life for themselves there such that they could have kids, grandkids, great grandkids to then have that individual be of the nation they were born at that particular time. They're having a conversation with me and for them to just cast their identity out as Irish, this island on the other side of the world for some of them are so far away that they've never been to, never seen, don't know much about, have no kind of real knowledge of the history of the living culture of the island. Um, it, it it gets a bit grating. So re someone referring to themselves as Irish when they're not, and, and again, it doesn't have to be born here. That's I didn't just say, oh, you have to be descended. You have to be actually on the island to be Irish. Um, like there are, families who have moved here as a kid and grown up here or there's people in the same way that um have moved from like they were born say in america of parents or grandparents who are irish there are people born in ireland who parents or grandparents may have come from germany france italy africa like you know and like there's a whole generation of people from nigeria i went to school with a kid who whose parents came from nigeria and I would not say he's Nigerian, like, you know, he was born in Ireland, so he's Irish. 
you know, he has cultural influences from his his other family members in the same way. But like, I'm not going to turn around and say, well, no, you're not because you're different. And that's where we get a whole load of. Again, see, I, I said it gets very complex very quickly. Um, we have to avoid areas of like racial essentialism or um, like uh, just racism we have to like you know be very very conscious of it but that does go both ways like you know someone born outside of ireland growing up in american culture that they didn't grow up in irish culture they grew up in a different culture that's not a bad thing it's not a bad culture it's not a lesser thing it just is what it is but then being able to open and explore their connection to explore their ancestry whether they have an irish ancestry or not or explore their passions or their interests wherever they come from whatever their lineage is like that's important to us and we are very clear about it anytime we talk about it you don't need to be irish to explore and study irish paganism again you don't need to be irish you don't have to have irish ancestry you don't your dna doesn't get you an automatic carry card you know any nothing like that at all it is about interest and approaching in respect of not just the spiritual practices but also the culture uh, from which those practices come from for me like for example i'm not going to claim to be a buddhist or an irish buddhist or um like a nepalese buddhist because i'm not uh, and even if I did follow a path or some teachings of like the Buddhist creed, then, you know, I would be following that, respecting and honoring that for what it is. And then also trying to respect and honor the culture that that comes from and not just take something because it fits for me. And that's where we get into the conversations and the narratives about appreciation versus appropriation, uh, which we've had many, many talks about that as well. And um, when it comes down to how a person chooses to identify themselves for their spirituality or for their practices. I'm delighted that Ali is being considerate and is actually having that question and thinking about that question. Um, like people being able to refer to themselves as pagan. I did a whole video on that. There's many people who aren't safe to refer to themselves publicly as pagan in certain areas where they're growing up or with certain cultural influences. So being able to declare yourself or to be like, you know, defined or to, be, to use that word to identify yourself as pagan is great. Um, if you are not Irish or from Ireland or have grown up in Irish culture, then I would steer more towards I, I practice or believe or follow my path is Irish paganism, but I wouldn't refer to myself as an Irish pagan. Uh, whereas me, I am Irish and a pagan, so I would say I am an Irish pagan. Uh, but that's mainly because Ireland is still predominantly under the sway of the Catholic Church and Christianity. So for me, identifying as an Irish pagan is me saying I am pagan in Ireland of Irish people. And that's why, you know, you can take your statistics, Catholic Church, and, and reduce them because there are people who are not good Catholic people or whatever in Ireland. Um, I was raised with a lot of that. I have a whole other rant video of there if you're interested in looking at that. But I, I'm very appreciative, Ali. Thank you very much for being considerate and actually just having the awareness around how to approach that question and how it might actually impact. Because if I were to meet someone and, you know, in another country where I'm visiting is like, oh, yeah, I'm I'm from down the road and I'm an Irish pagan. I'm like, I, I would have this conversation. I would be... I, can we clarify what you mean? Um, and it's not out of any detriment. There's not out of any, like, you don't get to use that word. You know, it is about trying to make sure that we're on the same clear understanding or connectedness as we approach these conversations and these narratives. And it's it's the same as, like, you know, introducing yourself to someone new and saying, hi, I'm John O'Sullivan, pronouns he, him. It can be as simple as that. I'm not making any formal declarations of anything there at all i'm just trying to be clear about you know how i would prefer someone to interact or to engage with me so that i can then offer them the same respect of engaging with them as they would choose them choose for me to do so and also for you know a middle-aged white presenting male individual to be able to use pronouns or to declare pronouns that makes it safe around me to for other people to declare pronouns because they know they're going to have their pronouns respected um, so it's worth having those considerations, those dialogues and those narratives. So, again, I if someone 
is Irish and a pagan, I would say they identify themselves as Irish pagan. But if someone is not Irish, but following Irish paganism, I would say, you know, oh, I, I'm pagan and I, I believe, I practice, I, I follow like Irish paganism is the way I would personally kind of suggest. But again, this is my personal suggestion. You've asked the question. I'm doing my best to honor it with uh, as detailed a response as I can. But it is down to your choice at the end of the day, what you choose to do so. And just because I have expressed an opinion on it doesn't mean you can't say, well, John's full of shit. I'm going to do what I'm going to do because it fits for me better. you know. Uh, but having the awareness and having the consideration of how the words we use can have different meanings, have different impacts, um, is a very healthy and responsible thing to do. Um, the last question does follow a little bit from that. And Ali was wondering if... Laura or myself weren't born in Ireland, do you think it would have taken you longer to discover Irish paganism and become a follower of the Morrigan and the Dacta? Um, if John was not born in Ireland, I have no clue if John would follow the Dacta. I don't even know if John would know the existence of the Dacta because, to be honest, there wasn't a lot of information out there about the Dagda when I started digging about around this. Like there was a lot of stuff in academic texts. There was the old mentions and the old stories, but it was it wasn't hugely promoted publicly. And what information out there was terrible information. Um and I had to do a lot of work trying to dig back to resources and trying to find that. The what set me on that path was my own spiritual connections to this land, to the island. And to my ancestry and my bloodlines here and, you know, my interactions with the Morrigan because she's the one who called me first. And so if I was not born in Ireland, would I have found that information? Would I have connected with the deities? I don't know for sure. I honestly have no clue. <laughs> I, am, I would like to believe that given similar cultural upbringing, okay, now, and by similar cultural upbringing, I would mean a culture that has been colonized by other countries, maybe even specifically England, um, a country that has um, been oppressed and colonized by the Catholic Church. Um, so like those are, those are two very specific things for a country to experience. And so we'd have to kind of instantly begin to remove certain geographic locations off the map because it would need a certain kind of cultural context for me to be the person that I am today with similar interests. And then from there, in similar cultural context, I, I would believe that the person, the, the version of John in the multiversal location that fits the paradigm of this particular question may actually look more closely to home then further afield. Um, I don't know if that version of John would know about Irish paganism at all, would find Irish paganism at all, or even if Irish paganism in its current form would exist, because in its current form, it's been Laura and me building this for the last few years to try and, you know, make it more accessible, to make it more kind of, uh, okay, really to combat all the shit information out there that was being corrupted put upon and you know abused from our mythology and our culture um and or transposed out of our culture to justify someone else's spiritual beliefs and so it's a very very tricky question um i would like to believe that certain characteristics and aspects of the dagda are always appealing and would always be appealing to me or any version of me in these multiversal contexts and that is his sense of stability and his compassion his care and his service to his community and um, but also his sense of humor and his passion and his his enjoyment of life and you know his relationships in all of those ways um, and then again adding into that the the lack of toxicity in his masculinity, like, you know, being able to turn up for his children, being able to kind of look after them, to care for them, especially when they get in over their heads. Um, so whether or not I could find similar in other deities out there around the world, I don't know. And the Dagda does strike me as fairly unique for from my current understanding. And it is not for me to speak about other cultures, other race, like other cultures and their spiritual paths of their ethnicities around the world 
Um, but when it comes down to time frame, like we're never too old to learn something new. We're never too old to question things. We're never too old to approach anything with a beginner's mindset, with an openness, with a curiosity, with an interest. And um, there are people who who join our Irish pagan school and they take a f the free classes with us. And then they're like, fuck, if only I had found you 20 years ago, 30 years ago, 40 years ago. You know, there's members of our community who are like, I'm, I've been at this pagan gig for 40 years ago, for 40 years. And, you know, I started when I was 18. I started to figure some stuff out because of my spirituality. My calling didn't fit with the major religions in their area. And then they were availing of the information that was available at the time. And they were relying on the information that was available to them. And in some cases, it wasn't great information, which is why the free resource that we give with recommendings of the books is such an important kind of thing because it can help it can help decolonize some aspects of that because there's people who we will never recommend um e day mccoy absolutely not but never on any recommended lists um ellen everett hopman i'm sorry never on the, the recommended list there are many many people out there who have taken taken aspects of spirituality from different cultures that aren't their cultures and monetized it for their own betterment for their own self-aggrandizement and for, for their own positioning and that is something we will never recommend and when it comes down to like ourselves here at the school we're not doing this to to prop ourselves up i'm not declaring myself the one true answer of irish paganism absolutely i don't want that burden i don't want that like you know responsibility but what I will do is I'll stand here and I'll say, here's good resources, here's bad resources, here's where I fucked up and it took I learned the hard way about my spirituality. I learned the hard way about the 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 cultural issues that, you know, have informed my relationship with myself and my gods and my country. So there's a lot of things that, you know, we try and teach and talk about to try and help people find a healthy connection and that is what it's all about it's an authentic connection to their spirituality to irish spirituality in the way that we educate and promote it but we can be wrong like it's um, like it's possible to take some information from what you've learned with us and be like okay well here's where it makes more sense to me or here's where it fits better for me that's okay you know it is about your journey at the end of the day but what we would always be cautious of is saying, you know, if you need to adjust things for your own betterment and your own deeper and deepening of your own spirituality, absolutely do it. If you're going to step in and start teaching other people or profiting off another culture or another people's work, we have actually had people literally take the resources that they had taken a download of the class slides and then tried to present a, a slightly adjusted version of that at other conferences, you know, just pretty much ripping us off, plagiarizing us <laughs> at a conference that we attended, <laughs> which was uh, an ultimate slap in the face. Um, but again, they will not pro profit or benefit in the long run from those kind of things because they're not acting in honor. Um, so would I be an Irish, uh, uh, would I follow or believe in Irish paganism or the Dagda or the Morrigan if I was not born in Ireland? I have no fucking clue. Um, but I would like to believe that there are many aspects of the deities or of Irish paganism that would attract and can and should attract anyone, whether they're born in Ireland or not. You know, the, the ancient culture of hospitality, for example, those who have more have to like, you know, are, are obliged, are obliged by law to provide safety and food and a night's nice comfort for those who don't. That was ancient law in Ireland, you know, and if if that applied from a cultural context to the top end, those who had it had to do this, had to provide comfort and not just, you know, here's a scrap of bread and a piece of meat. It was you sit at my table, you eat as if you are my family, you know, and you sleep in like where I keep you safe in those places. And it was kings, nobles, chieftains, but also Brua, which were the the top end of the farming caste in Ireland. And um, because they had the most wealth and from a cultural context, that's fucking brilliant. And that is something that I really wish we should, we had more of. Um, but 
there's there's a lot to be learned through Irish paganism or through the lens of teaching of Irish paganism that Laura and I present at the Irish Pagan School. So you don't have to be born in Ireland. You don't have to have ancient ancestry. You don't have to have DNA kind of codes to get access or to whatever. Absolutely not. Anyone who wants to approach with respect and who wants to approach with kind of openness, open mindedness, compassion and honor. Um, can find a heck of a lot through the Irish gods, goddesses, and Irish paganism and teaching, and um, whether they find it in our school or not. Um, so I do hope that answers that question there for you, Ali. And just to to address that last line here, you said apologies if these are dumb questions. They are not dumb questions. Absolutely not. As I've said before, and I will constantly say every time. Any question is an opportunity to explore the perspective of another, of another person or to challenge our own perspectives to consider it or to consider an answer. Questions are something I will always have time for and always try and make time for the best I can in my busy schedule. Um, but if someone comes to me and says, oh, I have the answer. Great. I didn't ask you a question, but good on you. If someone says, I have a question, I'd be like, great, sit down. Let's talk this out and see if we can both learn something from it. So these questions aren't dumb questions. Absolutely not. And, you know, you never know what you don't know until you ask. And other people may have had the same kind of queries, things popping up in their minds, unable to kind of put it out of their mind, or may have never even considered any of the things that you have presented, but now they are also enriched by an answer in this format, hopefully. So with that, I will say, Gaurav Mahaga, thank you very, very much for being with me here. Please do make sure you pop down and join on to our mailing list. So many free resources available to it there and so much kind of connection that we give and support through that mailing list. And so, you know, we want to invite everyone onto that there as best we can. So until next time, look after yourself, take care. Goodbye.